science. We get experimental science. We're curious, non judgmental. Welcome the heck in. Today we are having a special charity stream for Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. Just a little quick introduction that we're going to get Prabhutha on to chat with us. First today was Literate Ian. We've had a bunch of folks also coming on in here. We already have had some donations to our fundraising goal. We are, so this is the live image. We're actually at $85 of our $1,000 goal already. Prabhutha is going to tell us about where the money is going to. Oh my goodness. Yeah, we're at $85 already. We have yet to do anything. And we're already at that point. So big thank you all for supporting us so far. Now, I wanted to make a few quick announcements of what exactly we're raising money for. Prabhutha is going to give us some details on the research side of things of what exactly we're doing. But I just wanted to let you all know, every $25 you donate will actually be going to a, a raffle pot. Um, your opportunity to win will be for one of these. This is a uh, special Fred Hutch Cancer Center. Uh, well, it's a coffee mug. It is a coffee mug. It's a little bit, it looks like a beaker. I promise it is safe. It is safe to drink from. It is from potable water. So every $25 you donate, you'll get two tickets or every one ticket per $25. So we had um, our lovely friend Bex who donated 50. So she's getting two tickets. So every 25 you donate, you'll get a ticket to get in there. It will hold your hydrochloric acid, I believe, <laughs> Smikes. And you can absolutely do tests in it, Peter. Um, if we hit $500, We'll do a second raffle for one of these where you don't have to have donated anything to get an entry. And the same thing if we hit uh, $1,000 as well, we'll do those. So there is, are the other other components there as well. So you don't have to donate necessarily to get them. We're just trying to aim for $1,000 total across today and next Monday. So those are the two days we'll be doing our fundraising. Um, so the link is pinned. If you are interested, we're also gonna uh, now start chatting with Prabhutha. Uh, who is a research scientist extraordinaire at Fred Hutch. Uh, Prabhupada, <laughs> welcome the heck in. Thank you all so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Yes, of course. This has already been so much fun. <laughs> I've only been here a couple minutes. <laughs> You're not, not yet running for the hills, right? No, I opened the chat and I might just get lost in the chat. <laughs> and then we'll yeah. have to stop. <laughs> I think uh, I think the party people are excited today, as, uh, as, as I'm glad they are. So we're going to... Um, pull up a couple of things, y'all. We're just going to chat a little bit about what Fred Hutch is. Again, what we're raising funds for. Where then uh, Prabhupada is going to tell us a little bit about her. She's actually an amazing scientist extraordinaire uh, who actually get to work with. Uh, she's in the Early Career Leadership Program uh, at the Fred Hutch Cancer or in the Genetic Society of America, which is, I think, really, really cool. So we're going to delve into that element as well. And, and much more. Uh, we're also talking about some of her research. You'll find out where some of the money is going towards uh, today as well that we'll be raising. So again, everyone, welcome the heck in. Prabhutha, tell us a little bit about, um, about Fred Hutch and what, where the money is going to be going to today. Yeah. Um, so Fred Hutch, well, the thing is Fred Hutch Cancer Center, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. Um, and so it's in the name, right? It's a cancer center. We're in Seattle. Uh, and it was named after a baseball legend, as they tell me. I don't know anything about baseball, so I can't comment on the legend part. Uh, but his name was Fred Hutchinson, and it was named uh, by his brother who started it, Bill Hutchinson. Um, and of course, because Cancer Center is in the name, uh, there's, apart from the research aspect of it, which is what I am part of, there is a huge cancer center with lots of medical doctors. Um, there very well renowned something that i figured out because i wear my fred hutch t-shirt everywhere now and i always get called out they're like are you at the hutch and then they'll tell me a story about somebody that got cured of cancer there um so they help prevent cancer diagnose cancer treat cancer but apart from that they also uh help a lot of other diseases um like hiv aids uh there was they played a huge part in the COVID 19 clinical trials um I think it was the first freestanding COVID-19 clinical trial uh, was at Fred Hutch. Um, and the I think what Fred Hutch is most well known for is their pioneering work in BMT, which is um, blood and marrow transplant. Um, and it was sort of one of the first pieces of evidence that the immune system could help stop cancer. Um, so yeah, lots of cancer 
uh, treatments, but also HIV, AIDS, COVID, just infections in general. Wow, that, I mean, that, uh, that's then, like an every, well, not an everyday pro procedure now, but it's a very <laughs> standard one, right? Like bone marrow transplants, all of these. So it's like mm -hmm. all pioneered at this particular research institute. That's, that's really cool. Yeah, and then the other side of this is research, right? So there is um, lots of research labs that work both in understanding cancer, sort of at the translational level. And then you'll hear some about my work today, which is very basic science, where really what we do is try and understand the cell, but all of that can uh, also contribute towards understanding um, disease. Um, and we can talk a little bit about like, how the hell does what I do relate to cancer? Uh, if you want. Yes, that would be awesome. And thank you, Kai Fish, for the $75 donation. We're already at 160 and we're just at the start of the stream. Uh, so, Kai, I'm just <laughs> writing down the names of who will get the entries, and we will raffle off one of those uh, beakers tonight. So, y'all, every $25 gets you in. If we hit 500 then we'll do a raffle where everyone can enter. You don't have to have donated. Um, thank you very much, Kai, for that. I just, I'm so excited. I just have to bring this up in the background. <laughs> um, so Pravrutha, tell us where where might this funding go? Like if someone donates today, if I donate five dollars today, let's say, what is that? What is that? Does it make a difference to anyone? Is five dollars enough? Yeah, yeah, actually it is. Uh, this is one of the first time I'm working with a philanthropy team, and I was shocked about that too. Um, but five dollars will get you about a hundred test tubes. Um, so. I would say 100 test tubes would last me at least a two to three months, uh, if not more. Um, and that's that's just $5, right? Um, and then if you donate, let's say, to $50, um, one of the things that researchers will do is to take cancer cells and try and see sort of what how genes are changing in expression. Uh, and so $250 will help researchers see that what genes are getting switched on in certain cancers. Perfect time because um, we just crossed $250. We just got two more donations. Oh, there we go. Yep, from Mary Ann and <laughs> from awesome. Smikes. We got two more donations coming on in. So two fifty is what once again, probably what is what does two fifty get us in the lab? We can figure out what genes are getting uh, turned on in cancer. Well, depending on the cancer rate, but yeah. That's, that's so cool. That's awesome. <laughs> 250 already, that's crazy. <laughs> and that's in like any kind of cancer, right? That we're able to do something like that. Yeah, I mean, at, at the Hutch, we study all kinds of cancers. So yeah, we should be able to do that. Wow, I can't believe we're at 250, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, 285 even already. So we not only do oh, we have okay. test tubes for you, wow. <laughs> but we can, we can run a test as well. We can run that test as well. It's awesome. <laughs> Um, so tell us, a yeah, oh, and awesome. travel the world with a $50 donation. We're at 335 already. <laughs> the, just, folks wow. are stepping up and crushing it already. <laughs> we don't even have to talk about the science. <laughs> <laughs> no, so tell us, I, I'm really excited to tell people about you as well. Tell us a little bit about your journey and just how you got to the Hutch. And, and like, you're a postdoctoral researcher there, you know, like, what does that mean? What do you study? But also, how did you get here? And uh, also that you have a family too, and there you're a scientist and a powerful woman in STEM. Like, tell us a little <laughs> bit about that background before we get into what you what you work on on a day to day basis. Yeah, um, I want to say the start was really boring. I was the kid that was really interested in science, <laughs> and specifically biology. I hated chemistry. I hated physics. All I wanted to do was biology. I didn't want any of the others. Math was okay, I guess. Um, but I always wanted to be a medical doctor. Um, I think the I grew up in Muscat in Oman, even though I am originally Indian. Um, and I didn't I didn't even know research was a career option. So it felt like if you wanted to do biology, you had to do medicine. Um, but as I started to get into high school, I noticed that. The thing that really interested me was the open questions and trying to figure out sort of what we didn't already know. Um, and it felt like medicine would maybe give me less of, a, of an opportunity to do that. Um, and so I decided to do, I did an undergrad degree in biotechnology because that was all the rage and it just, it felt like it would open some kind of door. Though honestly, I, I kind of didn't know what I was doing. I was just like, I love biology, I'll do it. We'll see what happens. <laughs> um, 
And then in almost a very similar vein, I did a master's degree in genetics. Um, and that was really my first um, sort of long-term experience in research. And it was freaking awesome. I loved it. Um, I really enjoyed doing research. Um, and so I was like, all right, I'll, I'll invest the time and I'll do the PhD, um, which brought me here. My now husband uh, at the time partner was in the US and so I decided I'd come here to do my PhD uh, and that was in 2012 and I have stayed here I did a postdoc after I just I really fell in love with research um, and sort of just I think the curiosity um, to try and understand what maybe other people don't know and just understand how like living organisms work I think that's what drives me Nice. And uh, Pravrutha, could you introduce yourself one more time? We've got some new people coming in and they'd love to hear just your name again and where, where, you're, where you're currently located. Yeah, uh, I am Pravrutha Raman. I am a postdoc at uh, Fred Hutch, so a research scientist. Uh, and Fred Hutch is in Seattle, we're a cancer center. But you'll hear about the work that I do, about understanding how really organisms work. And then we can touch a little bit about how that relates to cancer. Awesome, thank you, Prabhrutha. Uh, finite welcome in. We've got a special guest today. We've got Prabhrutha on, and we're raising money for Fred Hutch Cancer Center, and we just raised another $25 from Kells Bells. Kells, thank you for the $25 thank you, thank dono. You. We are now up to $360. <laughs> we are at $360 out of a $1,000 goal that, by the way, is over two streams. So we're about to cross the halfway mm. point, and we're not even halfway into this first stream. <laughs> Thank you all so very much for all of your generosity. We're just getting to know Prabhutha a little bit now. Um, she's gonna. She actually find out was going into the details of where your dollars will go for these donations. So in particular, five dollars gets you a, over a hundred test tubes, which will last Prabhutha a few months to do some of her research. Two hundred and fifty dollars, which we already crossed, gets you lets us do a sequencing experiment to figure out what genes. Are turned on and off in a particular sample of can like tissue of ca from cancer cells, um, and so we're already funding experiments for us to do and try to figure out what are the genetic changes in cancer, which I think is it's really cool that there's that value associated with it. Like here's this number that if you raise that much, here's what it actually goes to in terms of the research side of things. Yeah, and I think on the medical side, because uh, you said our goal is about $1,000. $1,000 will give a patient and their family two weeks of housing so that they can get treatment at Fred Hutch. Um, oh, that's so cool. That, like, that, <laughs> that it's first of all, it's two. I, yeah. I wouldn't have thought two weeks, right? Like, that's a significant amount yeah. of time. And the fact that mm -hmm. you know that the $1,000 will actually help house a whole family and like offset that cost because you're already paying through the the nose for cancer research like yeah. well, not just the research but mm -hmm. like the i mean just like the treatments out of pocket that you have to pay right and that's huge uh magistrate thank mm -hmm. you for the ten dollar donation as well appreciate the heck out of you um and so it's just that i think that value associated with it really means like a world to folks of like knowing where your money is mm -hmm. going especially because like some charity groups right, aren't as transparent and just goes to a pot and it ends up somewhere but it's really cool and i like the transparency of hearing of where we're raising the funds for uh we have already a question uh smikes was wondering if uh we're able to have any epigenetic changes uh modified with some of these tests or is transcriptomics only rna level uh, where does that go? And Finite Singularity as well. Thank you for the $10 donation. Thank you, Finite. Yeah, that is a good question. I mean, I know that there are epigenetic changes, um, and there's definitely labs that do that, but I, I'm i not completely sure if we do that with patient samples just yet. Like, you can look for DNA methylation um, and see if it's at specific genes. Um, there's definitely tons of work being done on that, but... Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure if we do that yet at the level of the patient. Nice, it's more just- Maybe for specific cancers, not across all cancers. Nice. And so tell us a little bit about um, what you work on and then we'll get into the science behind uh, the organism, which actually we have a sample of to pull up for y'all. Uh, it's still microscopy Monday, folks. You're still gonna get microscopy today. <laughs> we have the humble, fruit fly here yes 
<laughs> I've got a wide-eyed mutant fly for us to look at. So uh, tell us a little bit about what you work on on this fruit fly. Yeah, um, I love that they brought up epigenetic changes because that's what we're going to talk about is epigenetics. Um, and we'll talk in a second. I work on proteins that essentially package DNA. Um, and I use a few different models, but the fruit fly primarily to do uh, my work. And there's lots of people in my lab that use the fruit fly. Um, the proteins that I work on, you'll see in a second, for the most part, they are very similar all across what we call eukaryotes. So this is, let's say, from yeast all the way to humans. Um, and so we can actually study them in the fly to try and understand um, sort of what the function is, how the functions maybe have changed uh, across evolution, which is what I work on. Um, and then, of course, the nice thing about the fruit fly is you can do all of this beautiful microscopy, right? There's just like great tools, both genetics to uh, make mutations, change things and see, well, now that I've changed it, now that I've sort of broken these genes, what happens? Um, you can look at different tissues, which is a really cool thing um, in um, the fly. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think if there's anything that I missed out. No, I think that, yeah, that pretty much covers everything that I would do anyway. We can do lots of genomics, um, but really it's a really well-established system, so we have so many tools to ask questions. Awesome. And uh, Coffee Rocks, thank you for the $25 donation. We are now at 405, y'all. We're we're just a smidge away from the halfway oh, goal that we've got. We might have to add in yeah. some stretch goals, y'all, if we keep going at this point. <laughs> um, uh, Guppy says, uh, Bill Grady and the GI group at Fred Hutch are developing tests to look at epigenetic changes in colorectal cancer for early detection. Nice. That's awesome. Like, another, like, preventative way of making mm -hmm. sure that we're able to catch it before it spreads and help save more lives. That's awesome. And, uh, cool. and Chris says that one cool thing about the flies, too, is that the rapid generation mm -hmm. of and generation C progression of mutations as well with the fly. Yeah, that that is a great point. I used to work with the with nematodes before, and so I never think of generation time because they're quicker. But the flies are really quick, too, especially considering those that work with mice, for example. Yeah, so there's definitely quick. a benefit, right, of working with the fruit fly over the mice that you have. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still not as good as the worm, right? But still have a pretty fast generation <laughs> time, right? You have the 10 days. Yeah. Um, we mm -hmm. actually love fruit flies here. We've got a, a SciComm character, as you can see. There's a, in chat, we've dropped their, our bananas into chat, and, as well as we've got some <laughs> animations for the fruit fly as, you know, an unsung <laughs> hero of the, of the genetics of the 20th century. And it's a, a really, really important animal. Um, we have a, another question up there. If we know of any recent advances uh, for the discoveries of particular kinds of cancers and like prostate. Um, so Bitgamy, just an update for you and for anyone coming on in. So Prabhutha works on one very particular question uh, in, in the field of cancer research. So she might not know all the updates of the entire field, um, but we're gonna be running it. Maybe we'll echo out on a little bit broader question of those. So for example, um, mm -hmm. Our friend Clay Mandev here is wondering if you have any in your research or the stuff that you'll be talking about us with today, is there any AI incorporated or machine learning that you utilize in your research? I don't utilize any AI or machine learning, but there definitely is um, a huge push for that and definitely something lots of people are doing um, is using AI and machine learning um, in their research. It's probably using to like predict particular proteins of interest or genetic sites of interest that you can be uh, looking to further check out. Yeah, and even um, I think there's a lot of like structure work, right, where you can predict the structures of proteins and see how they're interacting with other things. Um, and the cool thing is, if they're mutated in certain kinds of cancer, then you can ask what the mutation does. How does that affect the structure and then everything that maybe binds with it? Nice. Yeah, and it's. Uh, it's very complicated to use the AI because you have to go back and like how you end up checking that you've made the correct prediction. Like it's all based on human observation, but it's a it's a mm -hmm. massive uh, effect that you can do. And NMD ninety six, thank you for your twenty five dollar donation, ma'am. We are up to four thirty. We're up to four thirty already. 
and we have a lot of actually friends here in the community that have lost loved ones to cancer so we just i know i've lost a very important aunt of mine to cancer when i was a little kid and i had no idea what any of it meant uh, of like you know at the time like what yeah. do you mean we don't have a cure yet and we can't like pre prevent these things and so it's a really big meaningful difference that you're making in doing this kind of research and it's one of those i know like when i'm on the front line, lines of the lab as well it doesn't feel like you're making a world of a difference mm -hmm. because we're day-to-day -day looking at a fruit fly but it, it really does and so we just want to thank you for everything that you do prabhuta yeah um i lost my best friend to cancer uh not too long ago and she was we were 20 seven when she got diagnosed and then she passed away in, in like five or six years and i agree like the day-to-day -day, it does not seem like very much that we're doing but it it's kind of crazy how much like all of that comes together and really changes um science so yeah i'm sorry for your loss and hopefully like we'll, we can talk about the science today but we'll we'll get there we're making progress so uh, tell us a little bit about um, like what you're working on, and then let me know when you want to. We have some figures probably with actually made for the the stream to chat about and walk us through some of the basic science that she's working on. Let me know when you're ready to switch over to some of those images too. We can talk about the conflict. Um, let me know whenever you're ready to do some of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you first want to pull up uh, my favorite image of talking about sort of what? Pistones are and really how DNA is packaged in the cell. Tell me about this image. Oh, right. <laughs> tell me about this image. Y'all, Prabhupada has sent this to me, and all I can tell you is that two, two very handsome men in a lineup. <laughs> uh, I always use this image because I think it's kind of crazy. So we have on the left, right, we have uh, Dwayne Johnson and Jason Momoa, who are really, really tall people, over six feet tall. But right next to them is DNA. And let me tell you this all the DNA in a single cell is taller than both of them, if we were to sort of lay it out, right? And yet we have to fit all of that DNA into the tiny, tiny cell that we can't even see without the help of our wonderful microscopes. Um, and so this is sort of where the proteins that I work with come in. I work with proteins called histones. Um, and essentially what histones do is if we really simplify their function, it's to wrap up this DNA. Um, so if you want to zoom in right next to the DNA so we can look at that. Um, also, it's just wild yeah, to me so, that it's taller than both of the, like in one <laughs> cell. If you yeah. stretch it out, it's taller <laughs> than these very handsome gentlemen here. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. It's, and I think they're like over six feet tall. So yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. It's also good selection by the way, of our celebrities here. I, like, I think it's so really <laughs> cool that we've got, you know, like two very, you know, famous people that we all associate as really tall and like in the movies too, like they come up with this big presence and you're like, yeah, mm -hmm. DNA is in fact taller. <laughs> it's just, just wild to me. That's um, cool. So yeah, how, how does the yeah, DNA fit in a cell? Yeah, so it's packaged with the help of these proteins called histones. And what we're really looking at here uh, is very famously called beads on a string. Um, it was like one of the earliest discoveries that DNA was packaged that way. Um, and you can look up these images of these electron micrographs that show you and they look like beads on a string. Um, and that then gets sort of further wound together, right? So the DNA gets wound around these beads. And then that gets further compacted and further till we, if we go all the way to the right, um, we see the structures that typically you'll see um, in the movies or even potentially in some of the streams that you've done, right? Chromosomes. Um, and so that's how all of that six feet of DNA is packaged into the tiny, tiny nucleus of the cell. Um, and the proteins that I work with make up those little beads. So what I always found wild is when I first heard this fact that the chromosomes that we see in like the textbooks and the movies are actually, it's an absurd much more amount of DNA than what you act. It's not just this X and it's like that mm -hmm. number of genes. It's like that is wrapping upon wrapping upon wrapping upon wrapping. So like how that happens and your cell is able to open up regions and close regions and divide and mm -hmm. replicate the DNA. Like there's a lot of information going in there. 
Yeah, and actually histones will help with some of those functions, um, and we can talk about that in a second, but basically, like you said, right, you have to unwind all of that DNA for any kind of like machinery for replication or to express these genes, right, for transcription. Things have to be able to access that DNA, so if they're wound around histones and then sort of, you know, wound further around each other, it's really hard to access, but you can sort of modify that, if you will, um, based on the histones that are present in those regions of the DNA. Nice. Um, okay, so this sort of beads on a string that we have here is kind of what I'm going to use to illustrate uh, the point that I'll make about these different kinds of histones that exist. Um, do you want to pull up the other image with all the colored histones, maybe? Let's see this one? Oh, hold on. We want the... No. No, not this one. Um, it's the there's like four ah, balls and go. there's different. Yep, that one. Yeah, and can you zoom in on the left? Yep. Okay, so in gray, right? So this is, if you will, one bead. I mean, these are of course by no means scientific. It's just like prettier to look at. Um, and so in that one bead, we have four kinds of histones and two copies of each of them. So you can see eight um balls essentially in different shades of gray um and that is what we call core histones you'll find it across most uh of the dna is wrapped with that but what happens is you can have what are called variants essentially take the place of some of these core histones and so that's what i've illustrated with the orange color if you will so you can have certain parts of the dna where you now have this slightly different bead, if you will, and essentially having that allows for different functions. So if we go to the right, I've uh, tried to illustrate that with sort of two different colors. So you have regions of the of DNA that are more loose, so you can see it's more stretched out, the beads are further apart, and then you have regions that are much more compact. So in this, in and this first in, one, for example, like on this left hand side with the white ones kind of clustering together, those are compact regions. And then with the purple mm -hmm. and the white following, you see that they're a little bit more stretched out and open. Yeah, and so actually the purple, for example, there are there is a set of histone variants that can help you essentially read a gene, so express the gene, right? And for that, you might uh, imagine you need the DNA to be more accessible. And so there are histones that can get incorporated specifically to allow for such accessibility. Um, and so the purple is incorporated in a specific region so that the DNA reading machinery can bind there and then sort of help unwind that DNA. Um, and essentially you'll evict these beads so that the DNA is um, loose, if you will. And then you can turn uh, on but then... those genes. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, we got another donation. Uh, big thank you to Dacum for the $25 don dollar donation as well. We are up to Four fifty-five. Heck yeah! Thank you, Dakum. Wow. All right. Um, yeah, and then you might imagine, right? There are some parts of DNA that you don't want to read, um, and those I've shown you in the green or in the white on the left, right? And these are regions that are much more compacted and so difficult to access. Um, and you might imagine that based on the different cells, this can change, right? So not every cell in the body is the same. A heart cell is different from a liver cell. And so these variants will be incorporated differently to allow for that. Um, okay, so if we look across cancers, very often you'll see mutations in histones. Um, and so if you scroll down a little bit, um, you see the like stars on the green or even just there's a couple different ways that this can happen is either you have a mutation in the histone mm -hmm. and that causes um, the packaging to be different you can also have the variant get incorporated in the wrong place so now you can see that the parts that were compacted are now sort of more stretched out and loose um, and all of that changes how a cell behaves, how a cell functions, what is getting turned on, what is getting turned off. Um, and so these have been called oncohistones, um, and they are an active area of investigation. There isn't much known about it, there's lots of people studying it. Um, one of the things that I would like to do someday in the future is actually try and 
you know, create those mutations in the fly and see uh, what happens in the fly. So use flies as a model to study these oncohistones. And so what you're saying is you can make a mutation in a fruit fly that you'd observe in a human, right? And then you can try to figure out how it works in a fruit fly. And then the idea and hope is that'll be similar to what happens in the human. Yeah. Yeah, so, exactly. So are there, you know, specific genes that are getting turned on in the fly? And then can we relate that to what might be happening in cancer cells in a human? And is this so we have a question, Chad. So when you say that you want to make that mutation, this is more than just a single nucleotide that you change, right? From like an A to a G or something. Rather, you're going to change out a whole section. No, it could even be a single nucleotide, okay. and it'll change the amino acid, right? Um, their histones are typically thought of as some of the most conserved proteins, um, which is actually not true, and it's kind of a big part of my research. <laughs> um, but it's conserved enough that it, it has maintained function across all of these organisms. So there are um, parts of the histone in, that could be even just a single amino acid that is really, really important um, that can get um, pro what we call post-translationally modified. So you can have modifications, right, that are really important for function. But imagine if you change that residue, now you cannot modify that residue. And that can lead to a cascade of um, bad downstream consequences, I guess. Gotcha. There's more and more problems that you'll create down the stream. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it can it can be a single mutation, or it can be uh, multiple mutations. It, okay, and so you'd be able to make those in the fly and try to figure out how they interact, and then attempt to show it in the the hu like translate it to the human system as well. Yeah, I mean that is the beauty of the fly, right? We can easily manipulate things. Nice, awesome. So where? So that's what you're working on is a little bit of like the, the histones. Where does that fit into to cancer? Yeah, so mostly these mutations. Um, and something that we study is sort of how histones have evolved. Um, and it's kind of cool. Some evolutionary changes. So these are changes in different organisms, not human organisms. Those same changes can also be found in cancers. Okay. Right. And so these organisms are surviving, thriving with these differences, right? But then we have cancer cells. And the question is sort of, you know, are those changes benefiting cancer cells somehow? And that's why they are able to maybe grow, like proliferate um, in humans. This is all speculation, right? Very hand wavy, um, but it is sort of an interesting direction that evolutionarily these changes exist. And then now in cancers, uh, we're seeing these changes as well. Nice. And so can you tell us a little bit about, I, I know you're, you're going to be telling us about someone else's research today as well, but a little bit about like how those tie in, like what you're working on and then how like they're working on as well, the two together of like how that relates to the histone and then the biology as well. Yeah, of course. Um, so I am going to be talking about uh, the research that um, the professor that I work with and our lab manager do. Um, but my research is sort of very similar, right? And sort of the broad umbrella is what we call genetic conflicts. Um, I think the easiest way to think about this is, um, I feel like everyone will understand this, is there's always conflicts between uh, organisms, right? So the easiest way would be thinking of a host, so let's say humans, and then a virus. Um, and so here is like a very simple illustration of this, right? You can have two proteins, let's say one in the host, one in the virus. Uh, the virus is, or not even, just the virus and the host, and then the virus sort of attacks the host. You can have mutations that are created in the host that prevent the virus uh, from efficiently attacking the host. But now the virus can then mutate itself, right? And so you have this conflict where each will mutate. Um, it's famously called the Red Queen Hypothesis, um, where so, essentially... Yeah, we, we actually, I just want a shameless <laughs> plug. So Prabhutha works in the lab of Dr. Harmeet Malik, which those of y'all in chat who might, we watched, there's this video from Harmeet about the Red Queen Hypothesis arms race that we watch like at least once a month. 
because it's such a cool video explaining that you know it's it's you're just running in that same place because it's an evolutionary arms race and i just want to highlight to chat this image right if that there is this pathogen and it's re, re uh, detecting these red triangles but now if the host let's say mutate so it's one long red triangle and then a short red triangle then the the virus maybe can't detect it because it need it there's this extra piece to it but so then the virus mutates now it has the long triangle piece and the short triangle so then it can bind again and then the host now will mutate and maybe it'll be shaped like this you know weird rectangle mm -hmm. with the circle bit to it and then the pathogen can't bind right away but there might be a mut mutant out there that has that little bit of a variance and then it can still bind and so this is back and forth where no one actually wins because no one's actually mm -hmm. running ahead everyone's just staying put right yeah. yeah uh yes that was beautifully explained that is exactly what um i'm talking about right that is and i think that's the most intuitive way to understand that conflict but what i think is crazy and what we study um in the lab is also that these conflicts can exist within a cell right so not between organisms but this is happening in the same organism inside the cell um and so the conflict that we'll talk about today is actually between a histone and the dna that it binds in the cell and how that dna is changing and so the histone changes um and the, that those pieces of DNA that change like that are often called selfish genetic elements. They're selfish because they're out for sort of their own cause. Um, and one of the ways that's actually illustrated here is if you think of the triangle as a DNA, one way it can change is to really expand its sequence. And so um, the hypothesis is that the histone is also then changing to sort of keep it in check. Because uh, as you might imagine, you can't just start expanding your DNA, right? That that could be, that could have uh, consequences to the cell, uh, deleterious consequences. Um, yeah, so I kind of want to use the same illustration to illustrate that this can happen. I think when I joined the lab, that was crazy to me that this would even happen within a cell. Yeah, because it, um, if it's already the DNA is already so long. Together. Right. How does one fix that? How does one fix that? Right. <laughs> and Coffee Rocks, thank you for the resub. Yeah. Uh, at C0 sixteen months. F F thirty three R zero C K S just subscribed for sixteen months. What a cool stream to have a subversary. I fell into a black hole for about thirty minutes. Glad to be back. Welcome back, Coffee Rocks, and thank you for that <laughs> resub. We also had a few more donations come in as well from Ubi Iwerks. We had ten dollars come in. And literate Ian with twenty five, we are at four ninety, and almost to a raffle yeah. for a uh, one of these really cool Fred Hutch beakers. <laughs> Look at that! Uh, thank you all so very much for those donations and Coffee Rocks. Thank you for that resub, Madame. I appreciate the heck out of you. And Kennedy, that is not Lita. That is the lovely Pravrutha who is joining us today from the Ke <laughs> Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center, who we're raising money for today. So, Prabhu, that you mentioned, um, this is the image that you wanted to use to demonstrate to us, like how how these genes are working. One, one second, Prabhu, I have to welcome someone. And Cliff Fouser McLean is here. If I don't say Cliff hit it, he has to hold his breath until uh, you know I say hit it. So, Cliff hit it. game we play i have to hold my breath too until he hits it it's this back and forth it's we just we just have to just have to get into that <laughs> um, so this image is what you you also demonstrate like the work you'll be chatting about today so where where should we go to next what's the next question in like the research um field? yeah i'm thinking for a second oh right we can talk um about the specific histone that I'm going to tell you about, we can actually jump to the poster if you don't mind and yep. sort of zoom in on the very first image. You got it. I love microscopy. And I think I love folks in chat also are really dig the microscopy <laughs> and being able to see something like this. So tell us, yeah, what what are we looking at? Yeah, so the histone that I'll specifically tell you about today, the work um, that was done in the lab is. This histone that binds right at the center of that chromosome, right? So it looks like an X. Oh, an X. Right? What it really the, is. Before we get any, we we've hit halfway. We hit it. We've hit oh, that. We awesome. hit the halfway goal. We are uh, dacking with another twenty-five dollars. We are now at five fifteen. 
So we've hit the halfway thank goal, Jack. Thank you, thank you. That's crazy. So, Pravrusa, I have a question for you. Now, since, since you are the current uh, lovely guest, would you like us... Would you like us to do one of the raffles now while you're here? For Since we hit the goal right now, should we just do it right now? Yes, let's do it. All right, so chat, let me go ahead and set up. So, so Pravrutha, you have, we do a keyword here that you have to, to type to enter the raffle. Would you like to, to pick the keyword for today? Histones. Histone, all right. H I S T O N exclamation point histone to enter the raffle for one of these special Fred Hutch beakers. Uh, we will still need your mailing address. We will still need your mailing address if you win. Um, this is as usual the st same standard rules that we do here when there is a raffle. I'll need your mailing address. We'll ship this out to you. Uh, we're going to raffle two tonight. One is based on entries uh, that from our donations. But this was for hitting our halfway goal. And so let's just go ahead and raffle one off with Pravrutha here uh, to go check it out. Histonia? Histone. You got it, Smikes. You're in. <laughs> First time chatter champion. Welcome, welcome, champion. Good to have you here. We've got 11 entrants so far. Make sure to get in on those entries now, folks. Uh, exclamation point histone as chosen by Pravrutha to come on in here. Uh, good choice. Good choice, Pravrutha. I like it. I like, I was, I was, see, I was naively going to say it was going to be cancer that you would pick, but I, I like that it... Uh... Oh, whoops. No, 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 no. I like it. We're talking about histones. It only makes sense, right? Um, so, guys, let's do another 30 seconds. 30 seconds to get on in. And then when Pravrutha tells me to, we'll hit the raffle button and we'll see who will win the very first... The very first beaker, which is a drinkable from, and we'll hold, I believe we'll hold all of your acids and your bases if you're working in a lab, but also hold your coffee, which I think is also a nice little uh, element to it. So get <laughs> get those entries in. Get those entries on in, y'all. We'll roll it, and Pravrutha, what are, what are you thinking? Now-ish? Should we wait another few seconds? Okay, maybe a few more seconds. Okay. Everyone can get their entries in. All right, you tell you tell me when it's time to roll it. You, you're you're in charge. All right. Uh, I feel like I feel very powerful. Yeah, it's, let's it's, do it. Let's do it right now. All right. <laughs> Kai Fish has won the raffle. <laughs> Kai Fish, congratulations on winning one of the Fred Hudge beakers. We'll get this shipped on out to you ASAP. Congratulations, Kai Fish. The other ones, y'all, we will have one more tonight. That one will be based off the donations that we got, if they were at least $25. Um, but have no fear. Have no fear. We will have other ones we can raffle. We'll, I'll check with the Fred Hutch folks. If we hit that, uh, that $1,000 today, we'll, we'll raffle off that second one that we have, too, for where you don't have to donate either to get on in. Um, thank you all very much for that support. And Pravrutha, thank you for uh, wielding that power. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I felt very uncomfortable wielding that power, but congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all for those donations. All right, this is this is next. So we were talking about the X position. Um, here, what, tell us a little bit right. about like what, what we're looking at. What is What is this? What is this beautiful microscopy that we're learning about? Yeah, so um, what you're seeing here are chromosomes, right? We just talked about how it all gets packaged and we typically see those beautiful X's and that's kind of what you're seeing in the red and then below in the green as well. Um, what this is trying to show you, I think on top, it talks about C. elegans, Homo sapiens, Drosophila melanogaster, essentially across all these organisms. Well, not really C. elegans, but Homo sapiens and melanogasters are humans and flies. It's always that X, right? And you can see the little green spot um, in the middle of the X, and then down where you're pointing, you see the red spot. And that spot is actually a specific piece of DNA called centromeric DNA. That's the centromere, that spot where the two are joined. And the red is the centromeric histone. So that's the histone that we'll talk about today. Mm -hmm. so um, red, as it, it says there's the NH3. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how we talk about histones will get, you can have these variants, right, that are only at specific places in the DNA. So this is where this 
histone lives, the centromeric histone lives at the centromere, um, and it binds the centromeric DNA. Um, and it's essentially necessary for chromosome segregation. So as you go through um, the cell cycle, so as cells divide, you need to separate the chromosomes and then you'll have them duplicate again. You keep doing that, right? And so this histone and that DNA, it's essential for that process. And that's a process that you see across all the organisms. Um, we had a nematode <laughs> pop up. <laughs> I mean, I love nematodes, so I'm <laughs> happy about that. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is a process that happens across all these organisms and all these cells, right? And yet, the centromeric histone is changing. So evolutionarily changing, so it is different between species. Um, so the question that we will talk about here is, basically, is that changing for a reason, right? So do those changes mean anything? Because um, you wouldn't expect something that was so essential for life to be changing. Why change it? Um, and that's where this sort of genetic conflict comes in. So is there a conflict because of what it's changing? Um, so what um, was done in this work, um, really beautiful work, is essentially they took our favorite model organism, Drosophila melanogaster, right? So that's the fly that we typically study in the lab. And then they took its sister species, or a very closely related fly called Drosophila simulans, and they swapped that, they put the simulans changes into the Drosophila melanogaster. So here, again, that genetics comes into play, right? It's easy to make those changes. Um, Sorry, brother, but we, uh, <laughs> now we have dancing fruit flies. We, uh, and, and these are so closely related, That's right? Totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the simulans and melanogaster are so closely related that you can make hybrids, right? Like you can mate them; they'll make a hybrid, but they won't be viable in terms of uh, like they can't reproduce to pass on to the next generation. That's right. Yeah. So like, like yeah. donkey, but in this case, a mule basically uh, when they interbreed. No, so we didn't actually mate them. Here we just mutate the centromeric histone in melanogaster. Okay. So you, like you just simulans. genetically change one section of Drosophila exactly. melanogaster to be like the other species. So not like a whole chromosome, just mm -hmm. like a tiny, tiny section is now changed out. Yeah, actually just the histone, okay. right? Nice. And so what we've changed is that like little red spot, essentially. So the thing that's going to bind that part of the chromosome has changed. Um, and so we can pull up... I'm trying to think what I sent you... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think I sent you these like fly larvae, but there was something else that I sent too. We got videos too. Oh yeah, the videos. Okay, videos? yeah. Videos. So right. maybe we can start with the videos. Yeah. Um. These all right. Are so the be videos so we're cool. gonna show you. Okay, hold on. Let me. <laughs> so y'all, yeah. these are these are just so freaking cool. Like this is y'all the next uh, goal that we'll have for like fun <laughs> for like stream upgrades is gonna be a fluorescent microscope because. I I absolutely love uh, fluorescence imaging. Let me quickly find here our source. Always hidden away in the... Here we go. Boop. And so uh, I'll do this first one here. All right. So, yeah, what, so this what, is just... What are we looking at here? Yeah. Yeah. So this is the fly embryo. And it's like at the very, very beginning. Uh, oh, once quick, some quick egg question, made it, you just have... Quick question, just the imaging. So what exactly is fluorescence? And like so just a little bit about the microscope that you're using here like what exactly is that we're looking at like in terms of the creation of these things like what is this <laughs> oh good question <laughs> uh so this what we're looking specifically really making me think here um we're looking specifically at um a protein that gives off a fluorescent light essentially right so it glows under specific um at specific wavelengths of light. And that's what the microscope does, is essentially allows for you to see that. Um, and here we're looking at um, this. Actually, in this specific case, we've just, uh, the fluorescence is just to show you where the nuclei of the cells are. So in this one, um, every nucleus, so it's, a, it's a, the DNA in the nucleus? Uh, I actually think it's a different histone. Okay, so there's it's a not there, DNA. 
a histone, which is in every cell of the organism. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be glowing green. So we're lighting up every yeah. single cell, and we're just going to see where they're going to be hanging out. So in this case, actually, it's a single cell, but there's tons of nuclei inside it because okay. that's how the embryo begins. So what we're lighting up is all the nuclei, and they're at the very... This, if you can think of this as the, the entire oval is like a single cell. Okay. And then you have all these nuclei that are going to light up in the edges. So one giant cell here, tons of nuclei. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Should I play it? Yeah, and you'll see all these little green spots come up. Oh, it's oh, so cool. Yeah, it's isn't that so... cool? <laughs> it is really, really cool. So it's, uh, again, it... let's just do it. So there's all, those dots are those glowing cells, right? Together, mm -hmm. we can rule the yeah. galaxy. And Pragmatic Entropy, thank you very much for the resub for 11 months with your Prime sub. Pragmatic Entropy just subscribed with Prime. Thank you very much. <laughs> we are Pragmatic Raising Money for Fred Hutch Cancer Center. Today we have Pravrutha. Ramanan with us she is a uh, postdoctoral research fellow in the lab at Fred Hutch Cancer Center and is teaching us about the science that she's working on to, uh, you know, help help fight against the fight with cancer. Um, Smikes asks, are you adding a medium to make the spots glow? Uh, no, we're not. So essentially the protein, one of the histones that's present in all these nucleides, that sequence has been fused with a fluorescent sequence and so wherever you find a histone that's going to glow so we're not adding anything to it nice and thank you lady laura croft for the 25 dollar donation we're up at 540 already thank you lady laura croft so yeah right here is just <laughs> in the genetic sequence you got the sequence for the histone and you add to it mm -hmm. a, a gfp so a green fluorescent protein they're they're together and here, all you're doing mm -hmm. is shining a certain wavelength of light at it, and it excites that fluorescent protein to emit yep. a light of green or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. And that's what it ends up, that's what you're ending up seeing is that green fluorescent protein. Uh, and But yes. it's, it's right next to where it's on the histone. So wherever the green is, that's where the histone mm -hmm. is. Yes. Cool. Yeah. So that's our first video. So this is video number two. So what are we going to be... Can we play the first one one more time oh, yeah, so that course. it's easy to contrast to yep. the second video? Um, so what I'd like to be able to see here, right, is all these sort of beautiful nuclei. They're all in position, studded along um, sort of the edge of that embryo. So now we'll go to the second one. So this is just our regular Drosophila melanogaster. It has its own um, centromeric histone sequence. Now in the second one, what we've done is made those mutations so that it's more like the simulans, or that's the sister species sequence. Right? And what you see is you still have these nuclei, but you see how they're all starting to sort of fall into the middle? Mm -hmm. It's yeah, referred they're... to as a nuclear fallout. Yeah, and typically it's that there is some kind of damage, like the nuclei are not happy, and essentially that's why they're falling into the middle. Um, yeah, and it's, so it's this really is not dramatic. like up at the top of here. It mm -hmm. is. That's really, yeah. And really if you cool. look along the edges, you'll start to see these huge gaps where there's just no nuclei. Yeah. Um, because everything's starting to fall in the middle. So we've got a few um, questions about this. Uh, first, for about just the video, is that a time lapse that we're seeing, and like how much time does it take to to see these nuclei, and then also to have this fallout happen? Yeah, this is a time lapse. Um, this actually happens very quickly. I can't remember the exact time, but I want to say we're seeing sort of within the order of minutes. Okay, so it's a pretty quick time yeah, lapse. Yeah, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, but it happens very quickly because within two hours of the embryo, they start to form cells, right? So it, it's happening in a very short time frame. Gotcha. Yeah, so Smikes, at the very beginning of the development of these animals, there is that two or two hour window is just you have a ton of nuclei and then it undergoes a syncytial stage, right? Where you have mm -hmm. uh, the cells form and then each cell has one nucleus. No, it's different from humans, right? Pravrutha, it's, this is a fly specific yeah. uh, event that happens. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Other... And so this is the syncytial stage where you have one huge cytoplasm and lots of nuclei, but eventually these are all going to go into sort of little cells, right? These are all going to become part of different cells. 
And uh, the other um, question we have, I think, is an important one: is how do you know that adding the fluorescent marker doesn't mess up the biology, especially when you're talking about something like a histone, where it's modifying, right, opening and closing, so genes can turn on and off, like. How do you control for that tag not necessarily perturbing the biology? Yeah, so in this case, the tag is not added to a centromeric histone, it's added to a different histone, right? And if it did perturb the biology, then in the previous video, that was just our like regular fly where we didn't cause any other mutations, but we still had this GFP, we should also be seeing the fallout there. And because right? And so we're not seeing that fallout here, but we are. Um, when we then also make that centromeric histone mutation. And so that's your control here. It's just this is what you normally expect. You put in the fluorescent protein, you see the same thing. Mm -hmm. But then when you compare mm -hmm. here to this one with the fallout, again, like even the end of the video, right? Like you can see there's the the nuclei, yeah, like the just, bottom. yeah, just at the bottom, just like have sunken down, right? Crazy. And there's like yeah. you mentioned, like these aren't as tight as in that before mm -hmm. video it's just those gaps just really mm -hmm. form and like that's it's just, it's just really striking of a difference to see in the two videos yeah so how yeah, does this and i'll profess right at the beginning yeah we don't actually know why this is happening uh one reason could be that the dna is either getting damaged and we talk about how the centromeric histone is important for that division so maybe the division isn't happening well um so this is still the stage where we're not 100 percent sure why uh, this effect is happening, but what is very clear is that even if you took, like, made the mutations for it to be like the sister species, this like really important protein, that small change can completely change what's happening in the organism. Um, and just to illustrate that, if you want to pull up the images of the fly larvae. Yep. Give me one second. There's so many. I think this is really cool, <laughs> the fly larvae. <laughs> All right. Close that bring up this one all right all right here we go tell yeah, us about definitely. these so these are fruit fly larvae um, so this is after the embryo stage that we looked at so they do hatch so even with that disaster zone that you saw with the fallout they still live not they some of them will still live so not all of them okay. but there's a small population that can go on to become larvae okay. so what we're seeing on the left this like nice long larva if you will with these really clean um sort of lines that is just your regular fruit fly so no mutation to make it look like the cystic species but what you're seeing on the right is what happens when you make that mutation so even though they hatch and they're able to form larvae uh, what you're actually seeing here is they're missing their like mouth hooks and so right on top um on the left you should be able to see yeah, you see that right where your cursor was on the left? So here. Yeah, those are the mouth hooks. Yeah. Up here, yeah. But that is like completely missing on the right side. Um, <laughs> so they can't and then eat, just they overall eat, right, right there. No. Okay. I mean, they don't live past this. Yeah. Um, sometimes they're missing the entire head, essentially. Um, and then also, if you just sort of zoom back out, right, you can see there's the number of segments is different. The segments just look totally different. Um, and so these, they don't actually make it past this. This is sort of as far as they'll get. And uh, for Chad, there's a normal number of segments that you'd regularly see, right? So you can tell the difference in these segment counts just based on like visually counting them. This is what we expect. This is mm -hmm. the difference. And also the length of how these are appearing. Yes. Yeah. And we got another donation from Rista Rock. Thank you, Rista, for that $25 donation to Fred Hodge Cancer. We are $565, y'all. Nice. Heck yeah. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Risto. And so yeah, Sparky, the the larvae I would assume don't last past the initial stages of development, right? They hatch and then they that's can't right. eat; they're dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, so really, we don't get sort of adult flies from these, um, and so these lines are essentially dead. Um, which is sort of you know that's the first observation that we made was that you don't get adult flies, and then you kind of ask, okay, well, are we getting larvae? You know, what's happening in the embryos? Which is what. Um, I showed you. So we went kind of in the reverse order. I see. Um, but yeah, so we're at this point where we're not completely sure why this is happening, right? So um, if we think back to 
where the salt started. So if you want to go back to that like genetic conflict model. Yeah. Okay, so if we now put sort of names to these things, right, what we think is you have your Drosophila melanogaster histone, which is the like big blob on the right side, right? And then you have the Drosophila melanogaster sequence that it binds to, so the centromeric histone, se uh, sorry, DNA sequence. And that works just fine. But if you look at the sister species, so now you have this mismatch where we took that simulans histone and we put in put it in with the melanogaster sequence and that is sort of a mismatch right so um or maybe i'll restart this so let's say we have the simulans histone and the simulans dna that's a good match but then if you look take the melanogaster dna so that's the triangles in the second line right the DACA triangles it's probably different enough that even if the histone is able to bind it's not able to function uh efficiently um and so our hypothesis is that at this level too, right, this like genetic conflict is playing out where the centromeric DNA is one of those selfish elements that uh, we talked about initially. And so that's changing uh, between species. And then now you have um, these histones that are almost like changing as in this sort of tit for tat race, arms race, if you will, uh, where the histone is changing so that it can control the DNA sequence. Um, yeah. but something else to keep in mind right is it's not like it's just the sequ this dna sequence and histone that exists you have all these proteins that then bind the histone so then are those changing along with this right all of that is still sort of open questions so you've got essentially cat. a giant web of changes that you can have just from this one beginning stage right that'll have to end up happening and so yeah potentially so and, and chat's already picked up on this so this links to cancer somehow right um, so, like, can you take us back to, like, how it links back to the idea of uncontrolled cell growth and cancer and, like, gene accessibility. I think it's it's pretty of a, it's a very visual, it's great to have this figure because it makes it, I think, really easy to interpret it. But, yeah, lead us back to that. Yeah, so I think, um, I wouldn't say this directly links to cancer, right? But the way that it does link to cancer is centromeric histone is often mutated in cancers. So there are changes happening. And the question we can now ask is, is that some kind of mismatch, right? And is that mismatch either beneficial specifically to cancer cells um, and causing, so we saw a lot of DNA damage, right? And that is something that exists uh, across cancer cells is DNA damage proteins are often regulated differently. And so we can start to ask questions about like, one, are there shared mutations? So like maybe some of the similar mutations are present in certain cancers. Um, and then two, what do those mutations do? So just it starts to show us the scope of what these histones can do. So it, it's it's not even necessarily yet putting in the human mutation, but just understanding if you change something, what is the giant web that you can affect, right? Because mm -hmm. there's presumably so many things that are downstream going to be affected that you would have no idea even where to look, right? And so yeah. this kind of targets us like this is one histone. Yeah that's changed and you know the genetic change that you've done mm -hmm. versus taking a, a cancer cell line that could mm -hmm. have a bunch more mutations in a bunch of histones exactly. right and so now you're controlling in just that yeah. one particular element to it so what what would be like a good yeah. answer like what is it that you'd be looking for in terms of like what what would be like the dream experiment to do with this like how would you figure out like that kind of interaction or what would be like a, a something the, fun to test in that sense? Yeah. I think one of the first things to test will be to see how has cell cycle changed, right? So are you getting like, you should see these beautiful replicating nuclei where you always have like two copies of the DNA, right? But then are you seeing cells with more copies or is it that they're not even able um, to separate the chromosomes um, and that's some of the like first experiments that we're asking to, to sort of begin to understand that um, I'm trying to think uh, as for the sort of nuclear fallout one of the things we are assessing is like what's wrong with those nuclei why are they falling out and it's not every nuclei that's fall falling out right um, and so we can look for DNA damage markers and ask is the DNA damage, is there lots of DNA damage, right? Is it not able to get repaired? Um, but I think the first question would be, because we know the centromeric histone is important for um, 
chromosome segregation, the first question would be that is to see what do the chromosomes look like. I will say that this histone, even though we've changed it, it can bind the centromere. We've seen that. So it's able to go there. So our inkling is that it's the next step, right? So the things that it should then bind it are not able to bind or it's not efficiently binding. The other thing that would be cool to see is we talked about how you can these histones can get sort of misplaced, right? So it should be only at that one location where the X is meeting, like we saw. But we can start to ask, is that not true? Is it now going to all of these other locations and essentially misplacing the histones that should be there? I see. So it's like spreading and... almost throughout the, the chromosome. And then you can have other effects because it's... That's... that's Yeah. Is that... Wow, that's really, really cool. Do we, do we see the yeah. nuclear fallout in human cancer? Huh, that's a good question. I actually don't know... If we do, I mean, this nuclear fallout is very specific to Drosophila embryos, right? But there might be a version in cancer where the nuclei get disrupted similarly. Yeah, because I know, like, and I don't know if we see that the structural instability in cancers of the nuclei is pretty prevalent. And I know we're kind of identifying the three D space now of the nuclei just in regular cells. So I'm just wondering, like, you know, mm -hmm. that'll be an interesting thing to test too. Is is that positional information in the cell is also maybe moving around not that's not quite like the fog because you have membranes yeah. and nuclei and cells right in the human cancer mm -hmm. but maybe some kind of structural positioning as well yeah and we are starting to do sort of even just figuring out like is the dna more unwound or more tightly compacted when you have this different uh centromeric histone um, so sort of similar to what you're asking, I think in that, like, how is DNA accessibility changing or like you said, the 3D structure of it. Um, and I think that is part of like, are the histones getting bound somewhere else? Nice. Awesome. And we're going to have a, for those interested, we are going to have a second researcher on in a little bit. Guppy's going to also be talking to us about some of the structural information, other questions. So guys, we get two guests tonight. Freaking lucky is that. <laughs> Um, we did have another question, Prabhupada. Is there any connection between the telomeres of these uh, chromosomes and then the histones that you're also adding in? Like, have y'all looked at telomeric differences? Are you just focusing right now at the centromere? And like you said, there's the possibility of misplacement that might be affecting the telomeres. Like, where where is the, the connection there? Yeah, I think that is a great place to go. There is no, well, I don't know of any known connection between the centromeric histone and telomeres, um, but I think it would be interesting to see, right, because that's, when we talk about DNA damage, there's also potential that the telomeres are not getting regulated like they should, um, and that's all sort of great directions to go in. Nice. Cool. That's all, that's... It's so exciting to see this all come together, right? Because it's one of those where you might start off and you're like, it's a fruit fly and it's cancer. And it's like, <laughs> we know that there's genetic similarities, but the experiment is so elegant that it, it's something that we can really tie easily together, I think. Uh, we have Yeah, and I think there is something to just understanding how the cell works, right? That mm. automatic, I feel like so much of like basic biology discovery that has led to translational uh outcomes is like just trying to figure out how does the cell work and then you're like wait a minute that's messed up in council why does that happen um yeah yeah that's it's really really cool and it's super exciting to work on as well uh, i know we have you mm -hmm. for another five minutes uh you gotta guys Prabhrutha not only is a legendary scientist but legendary mom as well you gotta pick up her little uh <laughs> literate ian thank you for that gift sub to guppy <laughs> thank you literate ian um is there anything that you want to leave us with in terms of you think um, like translational work of the like what it's going to inform us in the long term and just to like plant that seed in the minds of folks again just so that we know you know what to be looking forward to how long might something like this take to transfer in, like the knowledge to human um, just le just leave us with that little bit of inspiration. Um. I mean, it really depends on the discovery, I'll be honest. Um, I think the discovery that like, I love using as an example is CRISPR, right? It, it's a bacterial defense mechanism. No one was studying it for like, how will this translate to humans? But once you find it and you start thinking of like, oh, this is something that we potentially really useful, right? And I mean, it's, it's crazy all the things we can do now with it, right? And I think there is great power in 
basic science research so like understanding how organisms work will very often tell you um how diseases are playing out um how long it will take i don't know <laughs> and i'm not going to commit to an answer there i like that um, answer <laughs> but i do i do want to say that like thank you to everyone for all of your donations and working with Hutch philanthropy has really shown me like the tiniest donations can make a difference and i think what's cool is like all of these donations go to research that we then have results to then go get like funded right through the government for example for the work that we'll do in the future so sometimes these donations help us do the experiments that we really want to do that the government will not fund immediately <laughs> so there's a big a big difference right between how like what you're able to do the funding sources because we actually had that question earlier is like presumably there's nsf funding nih funding but there's a proportion coming from these kinds of donations and it's really cool to hear that you know without these you wouldn't be able to do the really big experiments that you might try to do right and actually we got yeah. another it's like the clutch experiments that you want <laughs> to then get yeah. all the big funding from the government right it's yeah it it's amazing what like any amount that you can get will do so it's like those initial pilot experiments that'll influence what you're going to apply for and could potentially be the world changing experiment but this is the thing that's helping us get there and uh yeah exactly. we actually got another donation from our friend astronomy show who's an astro astronomer extraordinaire uh also funding helping fund some cancer research y'all were almost at six hundred dollars almost there at six hundred dollars wow. a thousand dollar goal thank you all so very much that's over again over two streams we're already like that flat blowing past that halfway mark that's crazy um yeah so, pravrutha thank you so very much for coming on and chatting about the science behind you know what you're working on and one of uh the lab managers is also working on in the harmony malik's lab um and working at fred hutch thank you so very much for your time today yeah i should say my lab manager's name is ida she is amazing <laughs> so shout out to ida awesome thank you so very much <laughs> All right, thank you, Belinda. <laughs>